Welcome to Nuked Radio. Today is episode number 16. It is Monday, April the 2nd. With me today is Jules and Miss Milky the Clown. And I wanted to say hi to um, Zori. Thank you so much for all the mushroom pictures that you sent me. And also hi to Drew. He was the aquaponics guy we had on last week. And he was on Madison's show last night. And I guess he did really well. It was a great interview. Yeah, he did a great job and lots and lots of great information on uh, keeping rads out of your vegetable garden. Yeah, and boy, I'm getting asked about that a lot, too, with uh, the planting season coming up. So today's kind of a doom day. <laughs> lots of crazy news over the weekend, and I wasn't on the computer much this weekend, uh, but I, I got on last night, and I was on until almost 4 in the morning reading uh, some of these stories some of them are from any news. Uh, some are from uh, USGS. Jules, you said there was a an earthquake interview. A Pacific Rim specialist was on too. I I didn't see that one. Yeah, a geologist. I'm not sure what um, mainstream station it was because it was cut out. But uh, I'll drop that in chat. Michigan actually had a two six Saturday morning, and there was also some. A, a large boom that was heard in the Poconos over the weekend. And then we've got these uh, crazy plume events. I've seen videos now from the College of DuPage, some of them from Dutch Sense and uh, some of them from others on YouTube, Kansas, Mississippi, Georgia, Arkansas. And um, one I saw yesterday was, um, it was interesting, you could actually see like chemtrails being laid over the top of the plumes. Kind of like they were trying to hide it from people checking the radar. Oh, that's nice. I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, and uh, Japan was shaking quite a bit. In fact, there were two uh, rather large ones right off of Fukushima, a 5.8 and a 5.1. And then a little further out near the trench, they had a 4.7. And north of Sendai, they had a 6.0. And I saw, I think Mexico had another big one last night, too. They had, let's see, a 5-3 uh, just offshore of where they had the, the big one the week before. So USGS is a good place to check out what's going on with the earthquakes. There was some really good news that came out. Um, this was actually from last week, and I missed it. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission citing serious concerns about equipment failures at the San Onofre nuclear plant on Tuesday prohibited the plant operator, Southern California Edison, from restarting the plant until the problems are thoroughly understood and fixed. The plant's already been shut down for two months, the longest in San Onofre's history, after two bleaks in one of the plant's steam generators released a small amount of radioactive steam. Neither regulators nor Edison have said that they believe the plant will reopen. Since then, unusual wear has been found on hundreds of tubes. Until now, the cause was unknown, but in this report that was published by the NRC, the tubes in Unit 3 were rubbing against each other and against the support structure, while those in Unit 2 were rubbing against the support structure but not against each other. Commission spokeswoman Laura Uselding said it's still unclear what is causing the rubbing. And that was reported on Fox 5 in San Diego. That is really strange. Yeah, I hope they're checking. That's probably what happened in the Poconos. <laughs> well, we have fault, fault lines rubbing together all over the place. That's what I was just thinking. Hopefully it's not um, seismic activity that's causing all these issues. Did you guys hear the audio of the booms in Wisconsin? No, I did not. All right, I'll try to find it on the break and drop it in the chat. Um, a guy finally caught it at like four in the morning. Something that we, a topic that we need to revisit again, because any news posted a story on this. Allegations of pet deaths after radiation exposure are supported by top universities' reanalysis of the Three Mile Island data. And what they said was Dr. Steve Wing and colleagues reanalyzed data from the TMI Public Health Fund, 
The result was increases in cancer incidents after the 1979 TMI incident were greater in areas estimated to have been more exposed to accident plumes. These associations were stronger in particular for all cancers and leukemia. Findings support the allegation that people in the area who reported skin redness, hair loss, vomiting, and pet deaths at the time of the 1979 TMI nuclear meltdown were not suffering from emotional stress, but rather were exposed to high-level radiation. 79, and they're just coming out with this now. Right, and you and I both had personal experiences um, with the pet deaths that were somewhat suspicious around you know, the time of rain and high rads. Uh, I mean, I definitely wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, and for those of you who are on my YouTube channel, you probably saw one of my um, my videos about uh, mutations, uh, about a kitten that was born in my household a couple weeks ago. And I've had a couple of uh, interesting comments following that. It says, I've been watching news clips here and there about first the increase of miscarriages on the west coast particularly oregon and washington it's nature's way to fix a mistake now we are far enough along to see the babies who didn't miscarry i have a personal friend who's having all kinds of problems with her fetus and is due in another month they have told her a different story every time they do a sonogram they said it had a tumor on its face and then changed to cysts on its brain oh my goodness where was that uh, Pacific Northwest. Another comment, comment from Chaotic 1981. Same cat mutations happened after Chernobyl, years after the accident, 600 miles from the site. Nobody talked about them. Our cats had mutant babies. Some had front legs distorted, eyeballs missing, no bones, and all the weird and ugly stuff. And cats are more resilient than many other species. I managed a pet shop for over 20 years, 20 years ago. The owner bred kittens. We carried puppies and kittens, reptiles and such. Never seen anything like that in the 20 years I was around animals. I saw one prehensile tailed skink that was deformed in that 20 years. Thanks for putting the truth out there as passionate as it comes. Much peace and love. And I've had, you know, numerous emails. Some of them I read here before about people's uh, pets losing hair. Of course, you know, you could attribute that, I guess, too, to the unseasonably warm winter, although the Pacific Northwest still had a, a lot of snow and cold weather. A few interesting headlines on any news. Uh, Arnie Gunderson gave a interview this weekend. Fukushima Daiichi is like a horror movie where the creature keeps coming up from the grave. It's not going away. And on another radio show, host says Fukushima Daiichi was on fire before the tsunami hit, and I've seen that video. Uh... Nook, Nuckle and Chen blog on YouTube has posted a, so, a couple of tsunami videos where you can, can clearly see not only smoke coming out of Reactor 2 before the tsunami hit, but there's this really bright flare off in the distance, which would be coming from the Onagawa plant. And there was white and black smoke that was pouring out of that plant. I have pictures of that on my Facebook page. Yeah, it was pretty horrific looking, honestly. Yeah. A radioactive waste specialist says it would be just a few hours before fuel catches fire in reactor number four pool if cooling water supply was lost. And they had a problem with that in January where the levels were dropping and somehow they were able to uh, maintain them but with earthquakes going on, something we definitely need to keep an eye on. We'll be back in a moment with Nuked Radio. Ooh, there'll be a change in the weather and a change in the sea. Upon the arm, there'll be a change in me. My walk will be different, my talk and my name. Nothing about me's gonna be the same. And we are back. We're still running through the any news headlines. And one thing that keeps being brought to my attention is the fact that, you know, three of those reactors over there right now, the levels are too high for people to work around. And, you know, when it's too high for people, sometimes it's too high for machines also. And we've got some 
cement mixing trucks that are pouring water on the reactors and pouring water on the spent fuel pools. And so I hope that those high radiation levels aren't going to affect that process because it's really important that that uh, is continued. Fukushima monthly fallout now 10 times higher than last September. And this is in Japan. There's a couple of tables posted of the total cesium counts. And again, you know, that's only one isotope that's coming out of there. And underneath this article, in related posts, a few other headlines caught my attention. Fukushima monthly fallout higher now than eight months ago in June. That was posted March 28th. Now this week, it's 10 times higher. Radioactive fallout and rain 10 times more than originally reported. That was in October. And in November, almost a million times more radioactive fallout in Abaraki soil than in 2009. Low estimate, question mark. I mean, these numbers are just ridiculous. I, I feel like playing hoodwink by an angel's <laughs> video again. <laughs> where he rants about the numbers. I mean, at some point, the numbers don't even matter. Right. I mean, that's the point that it's at. Yeah. They're so high that we can't even wrap our minds around them. Any News is also reporting on this uh, NRC decision about San Onofre. It says, we've really never seen the feds take such a drastic step. Locals are stunned and alarmed. I bet they are. I mean, this. how long has this been going on? You know, this plant is right near San Diego. They could have had an accident a long time ago from this stuff. I think they might be getting ready to spring a seafood warning on us because they also posted iodine-131 levels are really high in kelp beds off California. And now they're saying, mm, well, that might have affected the fish's thyroid glands. So I think we are pretty close to an announcement about seafood not being safe. MSNBC uh, issued uh, this story on April 1st. Japan issues gloomier forecast for future tsunami threats. Panel of experts says any tsunami unleashed by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake, which runs east of Japan's main island of Honshu to the southern island, could top 34 meters at its highest. Wow. Wow. An earlier forecast in 2003 put the potential maximum height of such a tsunami at less than 66 feet, which is 20 meters. So that's almost 100 feet. And, you know, a lot of these um, walls that are built to protect the nuke plant and the turbine buildings from being flooded are only like 18 feet high. I think um, Fukushima might have been 30 feet The revised tsunami projections contained in a report released Saturday and posted on a government website are based on new research following last March magnitude 9.0 earthquake and tsunami, which devastated a long stretch of Japan's northeastern coast and killed about 19,000 people. And switching gears here for a moment, we were talking about the booms last week. Oh, I still need to find that audio clip. I guess this was going on now in the Poconos this weekend. Boom violently shakes houses in Pennsylvania. Strong thunderstorms hit the Poconos Friday night, moving through shortly after 10 p.m. and continuing for at least a half hour. But the weather event that had folks talking was a loud sonic-like boom that shook houses at about 10.15 p.m. Gilda Spiota of Long Pond said, The shaking last night lasted unusually long. It didn't sound like thunder, and it didn't feel like thunder. I was wondering if something happened, like a tanker accident on Highway 80. Another Long Pond resident said, My son was at the back door letting the dogs out, and he reported he saw a large flash of light fill the sky toward and above the FedEx distribution site on Road 940. Then he heard a loud boom. It didn't look like lightning. He said it looked like a bomb blew up in the air. I was on the second floor of the house. I didn't see anything, but I heard the boom, and I felt it shake the house. I actually felt it under my feet. The floor shook. And I have never felt lightning shake the house like that before, and we've been here 20 years. Some readers suggested an earthquake or an explosion, but said that definitely it was no routine thunder. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, down in PA, they're doing a lot of fracking, you know. I mean, it's very possible that they could have had an issue and just not said anything. You know, people in Pennsylvania are pretty up in arms about the the fracking and the pollution and what's going on there. 
But honestly, I don't know. Just a guess. Something that seems a little unusual is all this, all the electric currents that seem to be in our atmosphere. And I posted a picture in chat before the show that uh, a guy took, this was um, on space weather over the weekend, of these sprites. And sprites are like lightning that goes up into the clouds. Sprite season begins. The first sprites of summer are starting to appear in the skies of North America. The strange thing is summer is almost three months away. Sprite season is beginning early this year, says Thomas Ashcroft, who photographed these specimens on March 30th from his observatory in New Mexico. At precisely two minutes and 26 seconds after midnight, there was an incredibly powerful bolt of lightning in the vicinity of Woodward, Oklahoma, that spawned these red sprites. And look at this picture. You know, I've followed storms my whole life, and I've only heard about sprites the last couple of years. And it seems to be one of those things that, like, mainstream is trying to tell you is normal. <laughs> yeah, I caught that. And, I mean, he saw it from two states away, he said. Actually, I just dropped the uh, the video in the chat for the sprites. Yeah, I, you know, I know that <clears throat> thunderstorms can actually, you know, bolts of lightning can hit miles and miles away from a storm sometimes. But these things are very strange looking. Um, and, and definitely check out that, that picture and see what you think. And pretty soon they'll be telling us the booms are normal too. And the plumes <laughs> coming out all around the New Madrid. And, you know, looking at these events that seem to be all unrelated, you can't help but notice their proximity to each other. We had the booms in Wisconsin. Then this weekend, we have an earthquake in Michigan. And then also this weekend, we have booms in the Poconos. Like, you know, it's going right across that same area of the country. And then the same thing's going on with these plumes in the south. The New Madrid is in Missouri. To the to Just west of there is where these plumes were seen Friday night. And then Saturday morning, they have an earthquake in Oklahoma. Again, just a straight line. So we'll be back with more doom and gloom in a few minutes. You're listening to Nuked Radio. And we are back with Nuked Radio. Miss Milky posted a video in chat, and I'm just looking at it now. Miss Milky, what is that coming out of Fukushima? Those are radionuclide releases? Yeah, and then um, somebody said that the, when you get to like 1 minute 20 seconds that it's either Manju or that, however you pronounce it, T-S-U-R-U-G-A. Wow, yeah, you guys need to take a look at this. Uh, it's just a few items up from the bottom of chat. It's pretty crazy. Um, you know, you just reminded me of something. I don't know if you guys saw, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, um, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, J-A-X-A, uh -huh. has launched a new satellite that can see radiation plumes from space. So I don't know if they're planning on making what they find public, but I found it very interesting that... Um, it is public now. I it mean, is. It's not as far as the space, you know, at least as far as I know, but they made one with that same technology for the ground. Oh, well, I'll have to see if I can find it. I thought there was something, um, some images that they released a few days ago, but I I'd be very interested to um, to keep an eye on that, you know, and see if they're just going to be looking at Japan or if they're going to be looking globally. Yeah, it sure would help me out with the forecast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm sure our government probably won't let us see it if they if they show the U.S. contamination. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it'll be heavily censored. Another thing, um, which I thought was curious, if you caught the forecast on Friday, uh, we had eight NRC event reports. Some of them were sewage spills, but a couple of them lately, and even MIT's research reactor have had uh, problems cooling their fuel. And I had asked Jim Walsh about that um, during the interview because of the decay rates being changed by sun activity. And last week we also had an exploding perfusion set containing radioactive materials uh, while a test was being done on a patient, and that event has not been explained. 
And I just randomly came across this article, and some of you guys may have heard of this because I guess this was posted, this has been happening since December, Vietnam's exploding vehicle problem. Have you guys heard about this? No. As if Vietnam's urban traffic weren't bad enough, motorists must now contend with a mysterious epidemic of exploding vehicles. More than 100 spontaneous vehicle fires have drivers fearing their vehicle could turn into a firebomb at any time. I guess this first started happening with motorbikes, and now it's happening with cars over there. And they have been checking the wiring in the cars. They've been checking the gas in the tanks, and so far they haven't found anything. My next thought was, why is this just happening in Vietnam? Hot particles? But it's not just happening in Vietnam. (laughs) And this is pretty crazy. I found a list where a guy has been posting all the fires and spontaneous combustion events that he comes across, and there's about 30 of them just in the last three days. That's crazy. On 331, massive fire in Haverville, Massachusetts, leaves more than a dozen homeless being reported by My Fox Boston. On 331 also, huge explosion and fire at chemical plant in Germany's Ruhr Valley being reported on RSOE. On 331, massive fire at Jug Factory in Delhi, India, and that's being reported on News Express. Also on 331, fire burned several boats at the Bayview Marina on Lake Ray Tubbard in Texas. Two are injured. My Fox DFW is reporting that. Also on 331, high school baseball team's bus catches fire on way to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, being reported by the New York Post. Is this a new phenomenon? What, what <laughs> is going no. on? I don't know. We're going to get into a neutrino discussion in a moment, and that's going to kind of tie into with this guy we have coming on this week, Matt Stein, when he talks about sun doom and nuke plants. Just some basic info. Uh, Let's see here. Massive fire involving more than 100 firefighters breaks out near Bardell, Kentucky, also being reported on RSOE. It was an inferno. They don't know why it happened. Explosion and fire at the Hot Yi Hotel in Thailand, also on 3.30. Another bus bursts into flame in Florida. Children and driver escape. And another bus bursts into flame while driver is changing tire in Australia on 3.30. It's being reported by ABC News. We had a spontaneous combustion event on a cruise ship on 3.30, also being reported on RSOE. And then there's a couple here, uh, RV trailer, another school bus evacuated, then explodes into flame in Delaware, being reported by ABC Local. Another bus exploding in Fiji, some injuries being reported by Fiji Village. That was 329. A spontaneous combustion event at a Cynthia chemical plant complex in the Czech Republic, also being reported on RSOE. And... Then there's a couple of house fires, mobile homes here, grass fires. I mean, uh, didn't, didn't we for a while have all those transformer explosions? Remember last and, year? Yeah, there's a few of those on here, too. Huge explosion at Micron Technologies plant in Boise, Idaho, in Jer 7. 200 are evacuated. This was on 327, being reported on Local News 8. Powerful explosion collapses pharmaceutical plant in China. Two killed, 26 injured, being reported on Inside China. And we've got a hotel, another RV, massive fire near Denver, Colorado. But, I mean, these are all over the place. Transformer explosion on 326 near Flatiron District in New York City, being reported on Gotham Mist. A house explosion in New Mexico being reported by My Fox Atlanta on 326. The guy who's putting together um, this list is actually leaning more towards a methane problem. You know, we've got this well from hell going off in the North Sea. In fact, uh, a guy on YouTube, I think it was Mr. Comet Watch, put out a video that that plume coming now out of this, um, this oil rig or this gas rig is heading right for Germany today. It's going to be blowing right through Germany. And don't forget, too, you also have it up in the um, 
the Pacific, uh, upper Pacific area. I know that there was a Russian scientist back a few months ago who said that it's the largest methane release that we've ever seen in the history of humans happening up there right now with the melting permafrost. Which if our temps go up this summer, like some of the scientists are saying, is could really become a problem. We've had extinction events from that in the past. Another explosion on board a ship off the coast of Mumbai in India. Seven were injured on 324. That's from RSOE. And this, this list is extensive. Explosion and fire in a basement armory of a British police station. Seven injured on 323 being reported by the Salisbury Journal. A lot of these events, he says, are happening near coastal areas, too. But we really need somebody to map these out. Yeah, I'm going to drop in chat. I actually posted a story about this the other day with um, a video and then links to a few scientific publications that I follow um, that are doing stories about these methane leaks. When we talk about this, we also need to talk about neutrinos. And I'm going to read you a small piece from the rundown on PBS NewsHour. What is a neutrino? And why do they matter? Oh, I guess I'm going to do that when we get back. We'll be back in a few with Nuke Radio. The has gone away. I'm going to make a, a, a change today. And we are back. What is a neutrino and why do they matter? This was posted January 25th of 2011. Neutrinos are tiny, teeny, nearless, nearly massless particles that travel at near light speeds, born from violent astrophysical events like exploding stars and gamma ray bursts. They are fantastically abundant in the universe and can move as easily through lead as we move through air but they are notoriously difficult to pin down. Neutrinos are really pretty strange particles when you get down to it, says John Conway, a professor of physics at University of California, Davis. They're almost nothing at all because they have almost no mass and no electric charge. They're just little wisps of almost nothing. Ghost particles, they're often called. But they're so important that we've built these hadron colliders all over the place to study them and try to find the God particle. And in looking for an article on neutrinos, uh, published five months later is another article in New Scientist, Neutrinos Caught Shape Shifting in a New Way. So they found them, and already they found that they were doing really strange things. But what really caught my attention was... um, the Japanese have one of these called the J-Park Accelerator in Tokai. Uh, it sends a, a beam towards the Super Kamiokande Neutrino Detector in K- Kamokai, 295 kilometers away. It began operating in February of 2010 and stopped gathering data in March when Japan was rocked by the magnitude 9.0. It was running the day of the earthquake. It shows the power of our experimental design that with only 2% of our design data, we're ready the most sensitive experiment in the world for looking up this new type of oscillation, which they've already admitted they don't understand how it works and what could possibly be happening because of these tests that they're doing. But what, uh, what I thought was really interesting, too, is that we have one of these in Minnesota, and they've been shooting it at another detector in Wisconsin. So could this have anything to do with these boom events? Yeah, wasn't there something weird that happened in Minnesota just recently, too? Something weird with the the um, facility? No, I, I'm just remembering there was a news story that caught my attention, but I don't remember what it was, whether it was earthquakes or booms, but there was something that, uh, that happened in Minnesota just recently also as well as Wisconsin with the boom. <laughs> and they both have these research facilities. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I dropped a link into chat for CERN. Well, that's the big one in Europe. And what's interesting is the logo is three sixes. I thought that was really strange. Yeah. There's they, have a, a, they have a uh, statue of Shiva outside of it, too. Yeah, the destroyer. <laughs> yeah. I saw pictures of that. 
Well, they've already had a big problem at CERN. In fact, this was in April of 2007. Bad math causes explosion at CERN Collider. The Large Hadron Collider at the CERN has suffered a big explosion deep inside that caused a leak of helium gas and a quick evacuation of everyone working there. The reason was a mathematical mistake that affected the design of the giant superconductive magnets made by Fermilab, who is CERN's competitor in the States. Now the company will have to repair and upgrade the 24 magnets that are installed on the 27-kilometer circumference of one of the most important research centers on Earth. And if I remember correctly, it blew out, like, the whole wall because they have these magnets that, like, guide the particles. Yeah, they had a couple accidents there um, where they had fires and they had to shut down. And the whole time that that was happening, I was cheering. I mean, that thing is evil. I I don't think there's anything good that is going to come out of a large hadron collider personally Mm -hmm. and that technology should not exist on earth that's you know they're they're mimicking seconds after the big bang that needs to be happening in space not on our planet you know and it makes you wonder if some of these freaky issues don't have something to do with the large hadron colliders Mm -hmm. so i mean we have a lot of things going on and and we don't know how all these relate to each other you know between the neutrinos the changing matter Changing decay rates, sun activity, failing nuke plants, spontaneous combustion, and then the methane component, the well in the North Sea, um, weird booms. And then we've got these research facilities, and they and they admit that they don't even understand really what they're studying. Mm-mm. And then there was an article yesterday about uh, a weather satellite now picking up all of these dormant volcanoes all over the planet are waking up. I wonder if we have any volcanoes in Michigan. Mm-hmm. I know there we have some in Wisconsin. Are there any in New York? Not that I'm aware of, but we have lots of mountain chains. So, I mean, that... I know I, there are some south of there. Yeah, honestly, I don't know if we have dormant volcanoes in New York. I can look, though. I'll let you know tomorrow. All right. So, you know, we like to always try to figure out solutions. It's a lot of uh, news to digest, but um, I wanted to read an email that I got from somebody. This is a a woman who posts frequently on uh, Radiation Health Solutions and on Radiation Watch. She said, I believe that we need to focus on real solutions. Entombment is a solution which, which could actually help. Phytoremediation is super cool and very interesting but it's not going to make a difference in the enormity of what we're dealing with. She thinks from her research that there's at least eight units in Japan, and I've got a list with ten, that have either exploded or melted down, plus probably an underground nuclear weapons lab that exploded, which they've been saying for a while might have been under Reactor 3. Because if you look at pictures, photographs from when they built that plant, that reactor had another building underneath it, which the other reactors didn't. And it's been postulated that it could have been of like a pl- plutonium refining lab, which they had agreed to do for Iran. If you remember, we talked about that last week. Fukushima is just a small part of it. All the media attention, what little there is, is focused on Fukushima. But the re- reason the radiation is so high around the globe, off the hook in northern Europe, through the ceiling in Canada yesterday, well over 400 CPM in the rain, is that we are dealing with something much larger than most people who are studying this issue think. Much, much larger. What we really need is the truth exposed so we can come to understand what we are really facing. We need safe food. We need to learn how to grow food undercover. We need to know how to effectively treat our water. We need to know how to keep the insides of our homes safe. Filtering practices that do not spread the radiation throughout our homes. We need people who have the equipment and expertise to test and tell us what isotopes are in our air, water, and food. And that's one of the things I really want to ask Lauren Murray when she comes on this week is what do we need to do to get the EPA back up and testing food and soil and rain and everything. I mean, especially with these... Reports coming out, you know, 10 times higher in Japan. It's still blowing over here. In fact, the cesium deposition on the West Coast, in California in particular, is higher than it is on the West Coast of Japan. And that was reported way back last summer. So I was interested in in her, um, this phytoremediation that she had talked about. 
And so I looked that up today, and it actually ties into what we were talking about last week, phytoremediation from the ancient Greek word meaning plant, and from remedium, a Latin word meaning restoring balance, describes the treatment of environmental problems through the use of plants that mitigate the environmental problem without the need to excavate the containment material and dispose of it elsewhere. Which if we have high contamination, contamination throughout the country, that's, you know, it's completely impractical. What you usually do in that situation when one nuke plant melts down is this top six inches of soil need to be gathered up and put in the ground somewhere else and treated like radioactive waste. I mean, you can't scrape the top six inches of soil off the entire continent of North America. This photo re remediation consists of mitigating pollutant concentrations in contaminated soils, water, or air with plants able to contain, degrade, or eliminate metals, pesticides, solvents, explosives, crude oil and its derivatives, and various other contaminants from the media that contain them. And there were a couple of plants mentioned here. It refers to the natural ability of certain plants called hyperaccumulators to bioaccumulate, degrade, or render harmless contamination in soil, water, air, contaminants such as metal, or we just read that list. Many plants such as mustard plants, alpine pennycress, hemp, and pigweed have proven to be successful at hyperaccumulating contaminants at toxic waste sites. Sunflowers are really good for getting cesium out of the soil, too. In fact, I bought a couple bags of sunflower seeds the other day, and then I saw a huge 10-pound bag for like $6 at the grocery store. So I'm going to get that, and I'm just going to plant them all over around my house. I think those and ones at the grocery store are sterile, though, so because they're like bird food, and they don't want them growing in your ground. Oh, okay. I did save some seeds from last year, so I might uh, dig those out, too. And that will help with the bees, also. So I want to thank Jules and Miss Milky for being with us today, and uh, we are going to have a great week. This is the last week of Nuked Radio, so we'll be back tomorrow, same time. <laughs>